reconstructive and anesthetic surgeon. And we also dedicate this session in support to the uh, Indonesian Society of Hand and Microsurgery and also the Indonesian Study Group of Aesthetic Surgery and Medicine because some part of the technique can be very useful in the aesthetic practice. So here with us, Professor Donald Lalonde, who is a professor in Dalhousie University in uh, Canada. He is a very uh, special person, especially also if we noted the uh, curriculum vitae with the American uh, communities. So he is currently the American Society for Surgery of the Hand Council Outreach and also its International Relations Director. He was the president for the Canadian Society for Surgery of the Hand, the American Association of Hand Surgeons, which is a different uh, society with the ASSH, and also the past president of the Canadian Society of Plastic Surgeons. He was a chairman also in the American Board of Plastic Surgery. Not only in the hand surgery and plastic surgery, he is an honorary, honorary member in the American Society of Hand Therapists. He published more than 100 papers and also 30 book chapters in one of the most, most uh, phenomenal work that he has done in the past and also is very contributing to the world is the book titled Wide Awake Hand Surgery, which is, he is the editor of the book. So ladies and gentlemen, with this uh, disruptive era, it becomes even more disruptive by the COVID-19, by the pandemics. And people change the practice. Some of the very important uh, practice that people have changed is people considering to move into using or elaborating the work under local anesthesia. This is not underestimate the work of our uh, counterparts, the anesthesiologists, but then even some anesthesiologists also consider that their practice need to be changed. So here with us, it's gonna be fantastic to join a lecture from the greatest person with the white awake hand surgery he will share with us his experience and best uh, knowledge with the uh, local anesthesia and how to give best comfort to our patients. Don, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much for uh, inviting me. I'm going to share my screen now. Yes, please. It's very honored to have you with us. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. Are you seeing my screen, Dr. Preston? Yes. yes, great. Great. And do you see the title slide now? Yes. Okay, fantastic. So uh, welcome, everyone. It's nice to see you all here. And thank you for taking busy time out of your practice. To uh, I, I'd like to share with you something that's very important to me, and that's how to inject local anesthesia so it doesn't hurt. You know, for the first 20 years of my practice, I hurt people a lot when I injected local anesthesia. I used to go wah, 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 very quickly, and I hurt people unnecessarily. And uh, starting about uh, 20 years ago, I learned how to not hurt people because a young doctor moved into my city and he wasn't hurting people at all, Dr. Rob Hayes. And so I'm going to share with you a lot of the things that he's taught me and that I've learned since then because I've done a little research in it myself. As Dr. Presetiono mentioned, I don't have uh, disclosures. There is a wide awake hand surgery book, but I don't make any money on it. All of the Profits go to the lean and green effort to decrease garbage and, and uh, cost in hand surgery that's not necessary. And also, I don't make any money on the wallant.surgery website. Uh, this is free for all surgeons and therapists. You just go in there, you can see videos, PowerPoint presentations, and both these are very good sources of information not just on hand surgery, but on local anesthesia. Not sore. Not so tough. Good. Well, with any luck, that was the worst of it. So uh, that wasn't sore? 
Not a bit. Okay. No, I didn't feel a thing. Great. So when you're doing uh, something like a forehead flap, uh, you inject everywhere you're going to cut and at least have two centimeters all around it. And this person only felt one poke. That's called a hole in one. <laughs> how, how much did the surgery bother you? Very well, really. Well, so uh, it's how long ago since we did the reconstruction? I would say it's at least a year and a half. Uh, I would say probably a two on the scale from one zero to ten. Yeah, compared to going to the dentist. It doesn't hurt as much as the dentist. How much the uh, freezing hurt when I put the needle in to put in the numbing medicine? How much did that hurt? The freezing never hurt at all. Can you tell me how sore the freezing was, the local anesthesia? The freezing, I didn't feel at all. So. Uh, not only for forehead flaps, but and at the count of three, you're going to feel a little sting with a 27 gauge needle. One, two, three. Sorry for the sting. You please tell me when that sting is all gone. You didn't get a sting. Okay, that's good. So this man is 95 years old and has bad lungs. You don't want to put this man to sleep. So we inject local anesthesia, 150 milliliters of quarter percent lidocaine. With so you one always reinsert a needle two centimeter or a centimeter inside the white pink junction. So this is clearly very white here. And because it's white, there's functioning epinephrine. So if there's functioning epinephrine, there's probably functioning lidocaine. Did you feel that little sting there? Nope. So this is a 20 gauge needle. And now I'm through that little hole. I'm going to just twirl it a little bit to make a hole in the skin. Now I'm going to insert this 25 gauge cannula. There we go. Did that hurt? Nope. So um, you always reinsert a needle in an area that's clearly numb. It has to be one centimeter inside the white pink junction. And what you're seeing me do now is to inject with a blunt tipped cannula. Uh, these are used for fillers by dermatologists and plastic surgeons. You can inject local anesthesia much more quickly uh, with a blunt tipped cannula because it doesn't hurt as these cannulas slide through the fat. <clears throat> This man had a very bad squamous cell skin cancer. It had a bad smell, and there were at least two large foci. And I did exactly the same thing for him that you just saw me do for the other fellow. And here he is right after the surgery. This is the skin graft take at, at a week. And I just uh, want you to see how bad his breathing is, you should not put this man to sleep. So to take that thing off your head, we took a big piece of skin from your thigh, right? And we did that all with freezing. So can you tell me how sore the freezing was? It wasn't sore at all. This man has shortness of breath on living. Uh, you know, you really don't want to be giving him unnecessary sedation. And if you uh, follow the simple rules of how to inject local anesthesia so it doesn't hurt, I, in, I did this whole area under local. I took a skin graft from his leg under local, and he just told you it didn't hurt at all. And we eliminated unnecessary sedation, which in a person like this is risky. It's, un, it's not safe to put somebody who can't breathe uh, asleep. And so the safest sedation is no sedation. So that for these patients, it's just like going to the dentist. When you go to the dentist, you don't have any special, you know, monitoring or blood tests or, you know, you, you just go because lidocaine and epinephrine are very safe. Uh, this man has bad dupuytrens, and worse, he can't sleep at night because he has carpal tunnel syndrome. 
And here he is on oxygen. And we did him sitting up because he wasn't well enough to lie down. At home, he sleeps sitting up. And so we did him like this in my office. This is in my office with field sterility. Uh, and here he is at three weeks post-op. And for the last six months of his life, because he had lung cancer, uh, and that's why he was on oxygen. He was terminal, but he couldn't sleep. And with the carpal tunnel surgery, he was able to sleep. And his daughter wrote me a nice letter after he uh, died and said, thank you so much for letting my dad sleep for the last six months of his life. Because it was terrible with the carpal tunnel syndrome when he couldn't sleep. And just a simple operation. And we just did the Dupuytrens at the same time, just because he couldn't straighten out his finger. So anesthesiologists who have used this technique understand its value. So this is Dr. Joshi, who specializes in hand surgery in England. And he's going to give you his impression of uh, wide awake local anesthesia no tourniquet. Rather than just having plan A and plan B, I'm able to have plan C and plan W if they'll plan what I They're extremely at high risk where they can't have a general anesthetic, they can't have a uh, regional anesthetic, and they need something which I know is going to work and is going to be safe for them. So I think it really has help me in, in those sort of circumstances where I think that I can't do plan A, can't do plan B, and then have to do one. So it's, it's made a big difference to my confidence in where I can apply the wall on technique, the use of local anesthetics, the confidence of knowing that actually this technique really does work. And this video was shot uh, last fall before COVID, since COVID, uh, in England and in many other places, Wallamp has really taken off because you don't have the droplet spread uh, of endotracheal intubation. There, there's no intubation. And also, you're getting rid of the crowding in the operating room. I, I can do hand surgery with one nurse. You know, sedation can be eliminated in emergency departments. A lot of the hand surgery can be taken out of the main operating room. Uh, and so it really does make a big difference to be able to inject local so it doesn't hurt. You know, you need to remember that most uh, complications in hand surgery are actually serious, serious complications anyway, are serious complications of the sedation, not the hand surgery. Uh, you don't get DVT from the surgery, you get it from the sedation. And the same as malignant hyperthermia, pneumonia, droplet spreading of COVID, urinary retention, overnight admission because of nausea and vomiting. If you don't give sedation, nausea and vomiting is zero. All these patients have zero nausea and vomiting. 7% of patients who have general anesthesia have nausea and vomiting. If, if you just adopt this technique, nobody's nauseated and vomiting anymore. We don't even consider that a problem, but it is a big problem. And all three of these organizations, the British Society for Surgery of the Hand, the British Orthopedic Association, and the Ortho Trauma Society in England, in March, all recommended that surgeons use as much wall ant as possible uh, and get away from general anesthesia. And if you go online, you can actually see their recommendations uh, for how to do it. And it's not just for hand surgery, it's for clavicles, patellas, uh, tibias. This is a tibial fracture done by Amir Ahmad from Malaysia. Uh, he's also doing elbows and montegia fractures and radius and ankles. And uh, if you know how to inject local anesthesia, tumescent local anesthesia without pain, uh, there are many, many things that you can do in patients who are too high a risk for general anesthesia. And certainly for hand surgery, uh, at least 95% of all of hand surgery you can do wide awake with no sedation, no tourniquet. Um, and so here you're looking at three flexor tendon repairs in a young man. You're looking at 
whole forearm tendon transfers in an older woman. Uh, you're looking at a perilunate dislocation done in Portugal. Uh, uh, and you're looking at uh, distal radius uh, fracture done in Malaysia by Dr. Ahmad, who published the first wide awake distal radius fracture, but this is happening all over the world now. And so uh, this is the essence of it. Tumescent local anesthesia means big volume. This actually started by dermatologists doing liposuction and then plastic surgeons picked it up from the dermatologist. Tumescent means enough uh, local anesthesia that you can see it or feel it at least a centimeter or two beyond wherever you're gonna dissect. It's like an extravascular beer block, uh, but only where you need it instead of the whole forearm. And if you put 40 cc's right there without moving your needle, where is it gonna go? everywhere and that's what you want but it's going to stay in that area and so if you inject like that 40 cc's on the dorsum and 40 cc's on the palmar side you can do something like this so this is a proximal row carpectomy that's a fairly complicated extensive wrist operation by dr depina from portugal and the patient can move during the surgery so you can see how your structures are going to rub on what and what they're going to need. And here they added an additional uh, cartilage graft procedure because they saw with active movement they were going to need a little more work than what they had planned to do. And I don't have residents a lot of the time. Uh, and so I went in and did this case uh, in the emergency room. And I just want to go back to that. So this is a fight bite, and this is a few days old. And what I do is I put 10 cc's in the palm, right there where the red dot is. I don't even move. I just, with a 27 gauge needle, uh, and then I inject with a 27 gauge needle all around the zone of cellulitis. I draw the zone of cellulitis, and I inject around the zone of cellulitis. This was at a, on a Tuesday evening at 11.30 at night. And uh, there I am injecting all around the zone of cellulitis, because if you inject in the zone of cellulitis, it's gonna hurt and it's not gonna work well. And then after the patient is completely numb, I debride the uh, cartilage and the extensor tendon and the joint in the emergency department. There, you, there's no reason to take pus to the operating room. I haven't taken pus like this to the operating room for years. Why would I do that? Uh, and then we walk over to the sink where there's tap water. Now in, tap, in Canada, tap water is legislated to be almost sterile. If we get one coliform, there's a boil order. They get on the radio and they say, you can't use the tap water to drink, you have to boil it. But I know that in the rest of the world, that's not the case, but that's okay, because you can still rinse with betadine containing solution. And even if your tap water is dirty as sin, it's still far fewer bacteria than are in pus. And so you can clean that out with tap water, and then you can rinse this with bottled water or sterile water or uh, betadine, just like I'm doing there. So this patient never went to the operating room, but he did get a lot of intraoperative education on how to keep his hand, how to keep his hand higher than his heart. Because one of the most important things about infection management is not just draining the pus, it's elevation, immobilization. Elevation, immobilization, and don't do what hurts and get off painkillers so you know what hurts. These things are almost as important as draining the pus. And so here I am educating the patient. I educated him the whole time. So he went from the emergency department uh, to the uh, ward. Here he is the morning after. And because he kept his hand higher than his heart, you can see there's no swelling. Uh, he was in hospital for a couple of days of IV antibiotics. And then here he is a month after. Uh, with a uh, good, so I've been doing this for fight bites 
by myself in our emergency department for many years. It works. With cubital tunnel release, I use 60 milliliters of 0.5% with one in 200,000. And you can see the tumescent local anesthesia. So we know that 50 cc's of 1% lidocaine with one in 100,000 is extremely safe. So if I need more than 50, like if I'm using between 50 and 100, then I go to half percent lidocaine with one in 200,000 epinephrine. So I take 50 cc's of 1% one with one in 100,000, and then 50 cc's of saline, and I just mix the two. And uh, you can see that the visibility is good. And I like this position on the right. You can see that without the tourniquet, and without uh, anesthesiology at the head of the table, this is a very easy position to dissect the ulnar nerve. And I want you to look at this patient. He's very comfortable, right? Now watch as he brings his shoulder down. Ah, severe pain, because he has a very sore shoulder. And if I had put him to sleep out like this, he would have wakened and said to me, Dr. Lalonde, my elbow doesn't hurt, but what did you do to my shoulder? When patients are awake, they can get in any comfortable position that they need. And I can put them in a more comfortable position for my surgery. This is way more comfortable than out like that for me to see the ulnar nerve. And if they, if they have a stiff elbow and a sore shoulder, you can operate on them on their side like that or on their side like this. And so what I do is I say, just show me what position you're comfortable. And I inject their local anesthesia in whatever position they're comfortable. Then I let them go to the restroom while the uh, epinephrine works for half an hour, because if you let it work for half an hour, it works better. And then they come back, and if they can tolerate the injection in that position, then they can tolerate the, patients are the surgery. with the injection uh, in of the cubital tunnel on their abdomen, we go ahead and do their surgery on their abdomen. For people with sore shoulders, sometimes this is a good option. The other advantage of it is that the visibility of the ulnar nerve in the prone position is really excellent. We actually did this particular case in the main operating room with field sterility. In our city, we are allowed to do main operating room cases with field sterility because we have proven to our administration that this is safe. It decreases the amount of garbage and the waste and cost of healthcare. For Lacertus release, and for those of you who don't know what that is, that's proximal median nerve compression at the elbow. Um, I've had this operation myself after my carpal tunnel didn't fix my numbness in my hand and it got rid of the rest of the numbness. For those, I inject 60 cc's uh, above the forearm fascia. Uh, we don't knock out the median nerve. 30 minutes before wide awake release, and uh, if you've done carpal tunnel surgery on patients and they still have numbness, um, then they might be like me, uh, who also had compression at the elbow underneath Lacertus fibrosis. And it's a very simple operation to do. It's just as simple as carpal tunnel. You go in and divide the Lacertus fibrosis. But these patients, including me, also have weakness of FPL, FDP2, and flexor carpi radialis. Numbness is not the major part of it, but they certainly can be numb. And especially if they're numb in the palmar cutaneous branch of the median nerve, because that comes off before the carpal tunnel, doesn't it? And so this is injecting the local anesthesia. There's the Lacertus fibrosis itself, looking at it from up above. It's just like the transverse carpal ligament. Uh, it's the same problem. you got a white structure squishing the median nerve just past a big joint. <clears throat> and if you release it, just like in the carpal tunnel, people get better. Half an hour operation. 
So this is the usual recipe that I use for tumescent local anesthesia. So I use 1% with 1 in 100,000 epinephrine, which we know is extremely safe. And so if I need less than 50 mils, that's what I use. If I need 50 to 100 mils of tumescent solution, like for my cubital tunnels, I add 50 milliliters of saline. If I need 100 to 200 milliliters, then like in a forearm tendon transfer, uh, or for maybe a, you know, spaghetti wrist or something like that, then I'll add 100, uh, 150 cc's of saline, not 100, that's a mistake there. I add 150 cc's of saline to 50 mils of 1% width uh, to make one in 400,000 uh, epinephrine with a quarter percent lidocaine. Dr. Prasetyono is famous for using one in a million epinephrine uh, and um, says it works very well. I have not used that dilute epinephrine because I'm not afraid of epinephrine. And I've had different concentrations of epinephrine in my fingers. I had one in a thousand in this finger at the same time uh, I had one in 10,000 in this finger and one in a hundred thousand in this finger. And the, the more epinephrine you have, the more intense the vasoconstriction, uh, the more, uh, the less it bleeds. And also the more epinephrine you have, the longer it lasts. And so there's nothing wrong with one per mil uh, epinephrine. And I think it's a wonderful innovation. And I congratulate Dr. Presetiono uh, for doing that and publishing all the papers on it because it's one thing to do it. It's a lot more work to publish papers on it. So thank you for doing that, Dr. Presetiono. At the count of three, you're going to feel a little poke. And I'm going to ask you to try to not move, okay? okay. One, two, that was the worst of it. And, and I really hate needles, just despise them. This needle was nothing, absolutely nothing. He kind of pressed on my hand three times, and then he put the needle in, and it wasn't uncomfortable. And then in a few seconds, it, it all went away. I felt the first poke. It is not painful. Not, not, not even a twinge, not, no discomfort whatsoever. No discomfort whatsoever there's a tiny tiny prick which is not even worth mentioning i didn't need to have any blood tests done i didn't need to have a chest x-ray done no tests well, i did not have to go in for tests um as opposed to going waiting in line and having tests and then going back another day for surgery i had to do none of that why anybody want to go into a hospital and, and and actually subject themselves to a pile of tests and everything for no reason just makes no sense to me. I had my own clothes on and I knew to wear a blouse that we could just roll the sleeve up a bit. I didn't need intravenous. I had no tourniquet on my arm. I ate before the surgery. I ate directly after the surgery. Like I said, I was not nauseated whatsoever. Uh, zero pain uh, before, during, and after the surgery. That was fantastic. It takes an hour and 15 minutes to do. Uh, and then you're back to your daily routine afterwards. So uh, this isn't just for carpal tunnel. This is for everything else that we've talked about. Forehead flaps, tibia fractures, if you know how to inject so it doesn't hurt. So we need to get into that now because uh, how do you inject so it doesn't hurt? But just one uh, more thing here, and that is uh, it takes 26 minutes in humans, not seven, for maximal vasoconstriction. Um, for many years, we thought the answer was seven because of a 1987 pig study. But level two evidence in humans and level one evidence in humans shows that it's 26 minutes. And it bleeds three times less if you wait seven minutes after epinephrine injection than if, uh, uh, if you wait 30 minutes than if you wait seven minutes. You just need to wait a little bit. Let your patients go to the restroom. Inject a few other patients, that's, that's what you do. And always make sure that you have enough local anesthesia in case you need to give more during the surgery. I hate giving more local anesthesia during the surgery. That means I screwed up. It means I didn't give enough. It's always because of not enough volume. 
but you always should make sure you have enough extra local just in case. This is like flying an airplane. You can't go, oh, I've given you know uh, my safe dosage of uh, seven milligrams per kilogram. We know that's ridiculously safe, but we stick with ridiculously safe because we don't want to have to monitor people. So when you inject local anesthesia, do you want your patients to think you are a magician? Or a torturer and you know there's not there's a very fine line between the two and I personally like the idea that my patients think I'm a bit of a magician and they think my medical students are magicians too this is very easy to learn it's very easy to teach and the whole thing is to always aim for zero pain of local anesthesia and zero pain of surgery. That's the goal every time. Just like every anesthesiologist wants to put people to sleep and doesn't want them to wake up during the surgery. That's the goal, okay? And there are all kinds of papers and videos. Uh, go to the wallant.surgery website, go to the hand E, hand.e of the ASSH and, and it's free for everybody to get in there and see videos and papers on how to do all these things. Um, and uh, I want them to just feel the little sting of a 30 gauge needle, especially on the palm or in children. And I want zero top up local uh, injection and zero pain during the surgery. So please read the papers, watch the videos. And there are 13 rules at least. <laughs> I know there are probably more. Dr. Presetiono probably knows more. But I'm going to give you 13 that I follow that I think uh, work very well for me. So small needles. You know, it's not a big deal to get small needles. And I never use 25 gauge needles anymore. I use 27 or 30 or 31. I use 30 in children or on the palm of the hand, 27 elsewhere on the hand. And uh, I like to put a 30 gauge needle on a 3cc syringe. And also I only use lure lock syringes uh, so that the top doesn't blow off, it screws in. And you know, every hospital, people will say, oh, I can't get little needles. You know what, <laughs> every hospital, has a human being who orders needles and syringes. And you just need to go find that person and talk to her and say, Mary, show me the form where you order the needles. And so Mary shows you the form and you go, look, Mary, you see right here, instead of ticking a 22 gauge needle, you see that where it says 30, tick there. Because if I was injecting your son, I promise you, Mary, that it would hurt a lot less if I used this little needle here. And you see these syringes? Show me where you order the syringes. That, yeah, you see these are called lure lock, same price. And look at that, these are so much better. So that's how you do it. Go find the person in your hospital who orders this stuff and quit saying, I can't get it in my hospital. You just have to tick the right box. So here you're going to see 31 gauge needles with a, a swedged on needle. This is hyaluronic acid filler. But what it shows is if you push the skin into the needle, instead of pushing the needle into the skin, that it hurts less. And so you can do this with any needle, any skin. This is called sensory noise. One, two, three. Zero. She felt zero pain. One, two, three. Zero. Pushing the skin into the needle instead of the needle into the skin helps a lot. One, two, three. That's the real yeah. speed. Push the skin into the needle. It hurts less. Okay. That's the real speed to do it at. And you can do that with anything. Just, just it's the sensory noise. The patients feel movement, they feel pressure, and there's so much noise in the area that they don't feel the needle go in. So, uh, and the little pinch uh, takes it away. 
So don't blast the local in quickly. Slow down and don't advance sharp needle tips anywhere that's not numb. Only put sharp needle tips in places that are numb. If you have those blunt tipped cannulas that I showed you earlier, you can put those in an area that's not numb, but you can't put sharp needle tips in an area that's not numb. And when I started years ago, I was taught inject quickly so it doesn't hurt long. It was macho stupid, that's what it was. And so I used to go and hurt people a lot. You know, you don't have to do that. Never let that needle tip get ahead of the local. The local here is blue. Instead, always have at least one centimeter of visible or palpable local ahead of the needle. And you see, I'm always feeling with my finger so that I can feel the tumescent local anesthesia one centimeter ahead. And I'm always thinking in my head, blow slow before you go. Blow slow before you go. It helps me slow down and be patient. Great. So you didn't feel the sting of the needle go in. It's not hurting right now, right? No. Okay. So now blow slow before you go. Can you back up a little bit so you can see my syringe? You can see the stuff going in. Thank you. Blow slow before you go. I'm always thinking that in my head as I advance the needle tip. I always want at least a centimeter of visible or palpable local ahead of my sharp needle tip. Because if I just advance my needle tip into this pink area up here, she's going to feel a sting. But if I have a wheel of local anesthesia going ahead of me, then she's not going to feel a sting. Can you please tell me if you feel any sting at all in the next few minutes? Because I'm scoring myself here. And I can feel the local advance ahead of my needle tip. If you're always saying that in your head, blow slow before you go, it kind of helps you remember to be patient. Because surgeons in general are impatient. We want to do everything yesterday faster. But it doesn't help patients get rid of their pain. Now I'm feeling it inflate up here, so I'm gonna stop advancing my needle. Still not hurting you, you're still gonna tell me, right? Yes, I will tell you. You're gonna interrupt me, because I'm just talking to <laughs> people who are learning how to put freezing in so it hurts a little less. I can feel it up here, I'm always feeling with my other hand, I can feel it all the way up here now, so we're gonna be in good shape. It's going to numb that up beautifully. That's called a sweet spot. When, when you can feel the tissues inflating where you want them to be inflated, stop moving the needle. The whiter my hair gets, the less my needle moves. Because just let the local go where it wants to go. This is like examining a candidate who's giving the right answers. Don't interrupt them. Let them give you the right answers. You know, if, if your local's going where you want it to go and you can feel it, stop moving your needle and just keep blowing right in that one spot. That's called a sweet spot. You just, just let it go. Buffer acidic local with bicarbonate. So the pH of 1% lidocaine with epinephrine, which is what we have in North America, is 4.2. And if you add one cc of bicarbonate, the pH becomes 7.4. 4.2 is 1,000 times more acidic than body pH because this is logarithmic, and that's why it hurts. So it hurts a lot less. And there's Cochrane evidence for this. There's all kinds of evidence for that. I always buffer my local. Insert the needle perpendicular to the skin. Don't inject in the dermis. Inject under the dermis. Uh, and also stabilize the syringe with two hands. You know, I've been injected well over uh, 80 times by residents with all different projects. When I, 
all the papers I've published, I'm always injected first because I want to feel what it feels like. And I've been injected, I can't tell you how many times, by the one-handed wobbler. So the one-handed wobbler is holding the syringe with one hand, and you can feel every little wobble until the needle site gets numb. So don't be a one-handed wobbler. Be a two-handed injector. Stabilize your syringe, just like you stabilize your hands when you're doing microsurgery. And uh, uh, that way they won't feel every little wobble. And you see that I'm perpendicular to the skin. Why? Because uh, if you go parallel to the skin, um, you're going to hit more leaves of the trees in the dermis. Nerves are like trees with trunks in the fat and branches, and the leaves of the trees are in the dermis. And so there's a, there's a lot more nerve endings in the dermis. And so the more time you spend with your sharp needle going through the dermis, the more leaves you're going to hit. And there's level two evidence in humans that it hurts less to go in 90 degrees than 45 degrees. So try to go in perpendicular if you can. Starting an IV really hurts <laughs> because you're hitting a lot of leaves on the way in. Also, don't inject in the dermis because of the same reason. You're, you're hurting all of those leaves. Get under the dermis. And as soon as you're in there, blow a little bleb and then pause. But you have to see your bleb. Uh, and if you're not seeing a bleb, you might be in a little vein, so you need to back out or go in a little more till you see it. Once you see the bleb, you pause and you ask the patient to tell you when the sting is all gone. When the sting is all gone, that means your needle site is numb. When your needle site is numb, you inject at least two milliliters without even moving. Don't move a muscle. <laughs> and just very slowly put that right there. And then your needle site is totally numb. When it's totally numb, now you can drop your needle down and blow slow before you go underneath the skin. So sensory noise for needle insertion, we've talked about that a little bit uh, when I showed you to use small needles, but... Um, the important rule about the phrasing is the don't move rule. If you pull back, then the needle comes out, I have to stick it in two times. If you don't move, it hurts just one time, okay? So try not to move. And at the count of three, I'm going to put the needle in, so don't move, okay? One, two, three. That's cool. I feel it, but it's out. Sorry for the little sting there. Nothing at all. I'm surprised. Compared to what I've been putting through, like with this. So you were uh, kind of petrified of the needle, right? Yeah, no idea. Right, because you hate needles, right? Can't stand. Right. How much did this one hurt? Out of like one to ten. Yeah. Uh, point two. Okay. Like point two, not even one. Okay, good. Like really zero. I barely even felt it. Good. So you never inject in the Corvain's canal or in a trigger finger tendon sheath, just in the fat. three, don't move, okay? One, two, three, good. You hardly moved a muscle. <laughs> so at the count of three, just try not to move, okay? You're gonna feel three little pinches, okay? One, two, three, very good. So even with digital blocks, you never do the two dorsal injection block, only do a single injection in the middle of the proximal phalanx with lidocaine and epinephrine, that's called a simple block. But I use a 30 gauge needle and I pinch the skin up into the needle and I'm pinching pretty firmly and you hold the pinch because the pinch is sensory noise. And, um, all of these things give sensory noise. Taking a deep breath, some people use vibrators, other people use ice, cold can be good. Uh, for me, it's just too messy and I don't wanna buy a vibrator. And I don't, I think if you just give a good pinch, it works good. pretty well. My dad says yeah. it's always um, take a deep breath and okay. for a little bit until okay. it doesn't hurt. 
this little girl came to my house uh, at Christmas because she had a, a paper clip stuck in her thumb. Uh, and she taught me <laughs> what her father taught her about taking a deep breath. It's a great way to do sensory noise. And ever since uh, I saw her do this, which is a little over uh, a year ago, I've been getting all my patients to take a deep breath because when you think about it, it's a great sensory noise. That's a great idea. Yeah. So at the count of three, I'll tell you when to take a deep breath, okay? Okay, you ready? Okay. One, two, take a deep breath right now. Oh, what a good girl you are. Oh, what a good girl. It's almost finished hurting. Can you please tell me when it's not hurting at all anymore? She just said it's not hurting anymore. And you know, that's because I'm still pinching and I'm doing a digital block on her thumb. That's what I did there. So um, reinsert the, oh, blow in more than two mils before moving the needle at all. I've mentioned that. Only reinsert needles in numb skin. It's got to be at least one centimeter better two centimeters inside where it's clearly white or if the skin is dark where it's clearly too messed and always inject too much volume instead of not enough volume nobody ever complains about being too numb you know a lot of surgeons say to me why do you inject so much fluid dr lalonde they don't need that <laughs> yeah after you hurt them they might have <laughs> And nobody ever has said to me, Dr. Lalonde, you put in too much local anesthesia. None of the patients, just the surgeons. The patients think that's fine. You know, that's just the way it is. Uh, and also you can use filler cannulas for big areas. And so I'm going to show you all that in the next video. But first, this is me. This is a filler cannula. And this is my resident practicing using a filler cannula on my eyelid. I am not feeling that at all. The, the cannula slides in the fat underneath the skin. It's absolutely amazing. These filler cannulas are a great way to inject local anesthesia. Their only problem is they're still too expensive until everybody starts using them. And they still cost about $7 Canadian. So they're not cheap, but uh, they certainly can accelerate the um, uh, injection. So uh, in this young man, he broke his neck, had a C-spine fracture and resolving quadriplegia. So he had weakness in all his muscles everywhere. Uh, and most of the muscles came back in most of the places. You can see this bicep is bigger than this one and he has a serious wrist drop. And so he has weakened muscles everywhere, but two years later, this isn't coming back. And so I'm gonna do a tendon transfer, but I don't know how strong the donor tendon is. And my plan is to take FCU to ECRL to restore the balance, because he's got ulnar deviation. Uh, but uh, uh, doing these awake, you can test your donor muscle. So I'm gonna inject 200 cc's of quarter percent lidocaine with one in 400,000 because I need to go both palmar and dorsal. Uh, and here he is, uh, ex I'm examining him in my office. So now I 27 gauge needle, pinch the skin, put it in 10 milliliters without moving at all. Then I take a 21 gauge needle and put it in Did where it's. What? Nope, I guess not. <laughs> put it in where it's clearly numb. He didn't feel that. And now I take a two inch 27 blunt tipped cannula and I'm gonna slide under the fat and sliding under the fat with this cannula, I'm going to inject 200 cc's in the whole forearm. And it's, it's, he's pretty much not gonna feel much of anything at all. You can do this with long sharp needles, but um, it hurts more. That's the only problem. And now I connect these to a three-way stopcock. Back then I wasn't. Now I connect it to a bag of saline 
three-way stopcock, and I just blow it in. But here you see the cannula going in. I'm going to slide that right into the carpal tunnel there, which is pink. And does that hurt at all? Nope, don't feel a thing. Very interesting stuff. So at surgery, there's his flexor carpial narus, and we find that it has 15 millimeters of active excursion. It's not as good as normal. Uh, normal would probably be about 20, but it's good enough that it's going to run my tendon transfer. So then I weave FCU to ECRL, and uh, <laughs> there he is extending his wrist for the first time in uh, two years. Um, and that was him going, ha ha, and because he could do it. And so it's a life-changing experience to do these wide awake, the patients can see that their tendon transfer works right away. We used to think you have to learn tendon transfers. Wide awake surgery has taught us that they can do it right away. And then this is really, really important. Ask for patient feedback every time. Right, so I'd like you to please score me while I put the freezing in. Because if I don't know what you're feeling, if I'm hurting you a lot, I don't know. And if I don't know, I can't get better. Yeah. So you're going to feel the first little poke probably when I put the freezing in. But after that, I want you to tell me when the first sting is gone. And every time after that, I want you to tell me if you feel any more pain. Because I don't know if you don't tell me. So you're going to feel this first little poke here. So at the count of three, I want you to try not to move. At the count of two, I want you to take a nice deep breath. Can you do that for me? So you're going to pinch three times. One, deep breath. Don't move. Great. Thank you so much for not moving. So is that still stinging in there? Don't feel anything. You don't feel anything. No. Did it sting when the needle Just went a in? Little wee, a little wee bit. Okay. So here's what I, and right now it's not stinging. Okay. So can you please tell me? If you feel any sting at all in the next 10 minutes. So getting this feedback from patients is the best way for you to get better. <clears throat> and I score myself every time I inject, I've been doing it for 15 years. And every medical student and every resident on my service get scored by every patient so they can get better all the time. And if the patient only feels the first poke, like in this case, then I score a hole in one. If the patient feels pain two times during the injection process, my medical student scores an eagle. If the patient feels pain three times during the uh, injection process, my resident scores a birdie and then a bogey and then go back to medical school. Uh, so we published this paper eight years ago where 25 consecutive medical students and residents were taught hole-in-one local anesthesia and then scored by patients on their first carpal tunnel injection. So this is their first shot. And 75% scored a hole-in-one. 25% scored an eagle. All they did was watch a video, watch me do one, and then they did their first one and they were scored by the patient. Uh, and that's the result. So anybody can do this. Uh, filler cannulas for big areas, I think we've mentioned that already. Um, here's the size of the needle. Uh, people sometimes say, you know, I'm afraid of needles. I want to be asleep. And I go, well, if you're asleep, you're gonna get a 20 uh, gauge needle. If we do uh, wide awake surgery, I'm gonna use a 27 or a 30, because they need a 20 to start an IV, or at least most of them. Some of them use an 18 to start an IV, as you know. And also, they get another 20 gauge needle for pre-op testing. So when patients come in to me and say, oh no, no, I want sedation because I'm afraid of needles, I explain to them the reality <laughs> of what's involved. So after I inject the local, I always let all the long procedure patients like tendon transfers get up and go to the restroom. 
because that gives the uh, local anesthesia time to work. I can inject other patients, uh, stagger them, and it makes sure that they don't have to go to the bathroom during the surgery. And always avoid intravenous fluids or an IV. If you have to have an IV, uh, because your anesthesiologist insists on it, then just you know shut it off for minimal dripping. Uh, but even antibiotics with Keflex, uh, if you take Keflex by mouth, you have 90% of the bioavailability as if you give NSEF IV. So uh, even antibiotics, we just give them by mouth, especially Keflex. Always inject from proximal to distal. So this man had eight flexor tendons all cut with a machete six months before I met him in Honduras. And so here we uh, inject 110 mils because we're going to take four flexor digitorum superficialis grafts. I'm going to take the FDS of all four fingers and use those as tendon grafts and hook them up to FDP uh, in the hand and palm uh, and up in the fingers. And so we blow up the whole forearm so I can go get my tendon grafts. And I'm going to inject 110 mils of quarter percent lidocaine with one in 400,000 epinephrine. And I always inject from proximal to distal because the nerves in the hand or in the leg are always proximal to distal. And even doing a forehead flap, you always inject from inferior to superior. Think of where the nerves are coming from. And I'm not a big nerve block fan. The bigger the nerve, like a median nerve, the longer it takes to numb up. The smaller the nerve, the shorter it takes to numb up. So that's why I like tumescent local anesthesia because it numbs up all the small nerves quite quickly. And so then instead of doing hunter uh, implants or hunter rods, you can dig the A2 out of the scar. So you just get your scissors in between the bone and where you think the A2 pulley is, and just make a little tunnel proximally and distally, and that lifts the A2 pulley right out of the scar, and you can pass flexor digitorum superficialis under that. And we did that to all four fingers, so we did four FDS grafts through the original A2 pulleys in all four fingers, and then here we are testing it, not tight enough. Yep, that's better, we made it tighter. And we did that for all four fingers. And here we are at the end of the case with the patient with his four FDS grafts through the original A2 pulleys. And here uh, he is in Honduras, three and a half months after surgery with me doing therapy with him. Uh, with the uh, WhatsApp uh, on my iPhone. So anybody can do this, okay? It's not that I'm particularly skilled or that medical students in Canada are smart. Well, yeah, they are. <laughs> but so is everybody else. And uh, we can all do this if we just take a little longer to inject and learn from our patients. The usual causes of painful local anesthesia, injecting big volumes too fast, moving the needle too fast, and not injecting enough volume. Those are the three usual causes of pain. And if you're still hurting people with local anesthesia, please stop. You know, it took me 20 years of hurting people before I learned how not to. You're never too old to stop hurting people, okay? So once you can do this, you're gonna get way better at flexor tendon repairs because flexor tendon repairs done awake are so much better than they were asleep. The results are getting better all over the world because people are doing them awake all over the world now. And today we almost get no rupture and no tenolysis using wide awake repair and up to half a fist of true active movement. None of this full fist place and hold, no more quinert rubber bands. Um, 
flexor tendon is getting better. And also venting pulleys. You now can vent the entire A2 or A4 pulley. Here you just saw me cut the A4 pulley, okay? I just cut it. And then after each pulley that I, uh, but I don't just whack out the whole thing. I just take out what I need to. So I just divided the A4 pulley. Now I can see that this little piece of cruciate pulley right here is in my way. This A3 pulley is not gonna be in my way. I don't need to cut it. But if I do, I cut it. But I can tell if it's in my way with active movement. So you incrementally vent your pulleys as you need to. And the new rule is that you can divide, there I am dividing that little cruciate pulley, and now it fits. I don't need to divide her A3 pulley. And so there's no clinically significant bowstringing on the table with A4 gone. And there's no clinically significant bowstringing after the surgery with A4 gone. And so the old days, you can't vent A2 or A4 are gone. The new pulley rules are you can vent up to one and a half to two centimeters of total pulley venting. So you can either vent A2 or A4. Most of the time you can preserve at least part of A2 because it's less than one and a half centimeters. And why one and a half to two centimeters? Because long skinny fingers, you can take two centimeters and not get bowstring. Short fat fingers like mine, uh, one and a half centimeters before you start to get clinically significant bowstringing. They're going to get a little bit of bowstringing, but bowstringing is not cancer. And if you don't vent the pulleys, you're going to get tendon ruptures. You're going to have to come back and do tenolysis. Uh, this isn't a flexor tendon talk. This is how to inject local so it doesn't hurt talk. But it, so let me explain the theory of the movement that we're going to do when Amanda starts you moving on Friday. The goal is to move it just a little bit so it doesn't get stuck, but not to move it too much so that it rips apart. It doesn't take much to rip this apart because the stitches are only about one-tenth as strong as your tendon. You're not going to use it at all. You're just going to move it just enough to keep it moving so it doesn't get stuck. What's the most important rule when we get you to start moving it? I can move it, but I can't use it. Important rule when you start moving it on Friday? I can move it, but I can't use it. So it's Monday morning. You've got no Advil, no Tylenol on board. We're three days after the flexor tendon repair. And what's the most important rule when we let you move it today? I can move it, but I can't use it. This intraoperative education piece is probably the single most important thing about wide awake surgery. You know, the first years of my life, I used to talk to the nurses during the surgery or talk to the anesthetists when the patient was asleep. Now, I spend most of my time educating the most important person in the room. That's the patient. And educating a patient during surgery is well worth the investment of time because that has decreased my complications more than just about everything else that I do. For example, when I'm operating on a flexor tendon, I say, so what were you planning to do this week? Oh, I'm taking my kids to Disney World in Florida. Oh, really? Well, maybe you can do that, but I'll tell you, there's gonna be some changes in the way you do that. Uh, and then you put reality in the situation, and maybe he's not even going to go this time. With extensor tendon lacerations, same thing. Intraoperative education, intraoperative assessment of relative motion, extension splinting. Uh, there's just a pap new paper that's come out of that. They live in these splints uh, instead of being immobilized for four weeks because those splints decrease the excursion and they decrease the tension on the extensor tendon. So a lot of these patients can go to work four days after surgery. This man worked on a fishing boat. He was a workman's compensation case and he went back to work 16 days after surgery with his relative motion extension splint. And here he is at seven months after surgery. So 
wide awake surgery has improved just about most things, uh, including fractures. So with fractures, you K-wire them, and then you see how stable your K-wires are. And then you can start early protected movement, just like you do for flexor tendon repair. So here he is at three days after surgery, starting early protected movement. And he can do whatever doesn't hurt. And he just keeps that finger going enough so that it doesn't get stuck. Here he is at 10 days after surgery not doing what hurts and straighten lovely does that hurt uh it's it's getting to the point where it hurts yeah i push it to that point but i don't push it beyond that perfect yeah, that's exactly what i want to hear and then you pull the k wires out when the fracture is no longer sore to palpation in my patients that's usually between sort of two and a half three three and a half weeks uh, if if the fracture is closed and there's good blood supply and they're not smokers. And here he is at four weeks uh, after surgery. So there are two problems though with lidocaine and epinephrine. The first is the adrenaline rush. And I like to warn people about this. Teddy probably doesn't get it because he uses low dose epinephrine. But about a third of my patients do get a little rush. Uh, and I say to each and every patient, you might feel shaky, like you've had a little too much coffee, um, or that you might be afraid. It's not your nerves. Blame it on me. It's because there's adrenaline in there. And you might get a little adrenaline rush. If you get it, don't worry, be happy. You're not allergic to it. It's normal, and it's going to go away all by itself in 15 or 20 minutes. And the second problem is that needles just make people faint. And so does local. So fainting happens because there's not enough blood going to your brain. So you avoid fainting by injecting people lying down always. And then recognize that if patients say, I'm not feeling very well, or I think I'm going to be sick, or if they get pale between the eyes, or they start to yawn, there's not enough blood going to their brain. And so what you do is put your hand under their knees, lift up their hips, two liters of blood in their thighs goes directly to their brain now. You take the pillow out from under their head, more blood to the brain. Put the pillow underneath the feet, more blood to the brain. Put the bed in Trendelenburg, more blood to the brain. You've seen me do that, that's real time. This was a real event in a deaf person. This person is explaining to the deaf person what I'm doing. I'm used to doing that because I do it in one or two percent of cases. Then you can let the nurse run for the cold, wet face cloth, which does absolutely nothing for cerebral blood flow. And I've actually stopped my nurses from doing that because it doesn't do anything. There is another limit to wide awake surgery without sedation. You must be gentle and kind. You know, this is not for rough surgeons. This is for surgeons like Dr. Prasetyono, who actually sings with his patients during the surgery. This is not for surgery who don't, for surgeons who don't like talking to patients. And, you know, talking to patients, you gotta be able to do that. If you're not into that, then this is probably not for you. Give them sedation, put them to sleep. Now, if you're interested in more information on flexor tendons, extensor tendons, finger fractures, just uh, YouTube or Google Lalonde Pulvertaft. Uh, there's two hours of lectures uh, that you can go look at that are more specific for those topics. And one final thing, uh, Dr. Presetiono and I need surgeon volunteers to help make webinars better. So if any of you out there are a surgeon or a resident and you, you want to help us make webinars better, we're asking a lot. We're asking for a one-hour interview between Indonesia and wherever you are to the United States uh, where one of Dr. Kevin Chung's assistants in Michigan would interview you. So for them, it would be early in the morning like it is for me now. And if you're in Asia, it would be in the evening. And we need an hour of your time to interview you. And we need 30 volunteers. So please help us. 
uh, if, if you are willing. And you can email me at dlalonde at drlalonde.ca or contact Dr. Presetiono, who's going to also perhaps say something about this. And I just want to make one more plug for further information that's free. If you just Google hand.e, as in electronic, A-S-S-H, or go to the American Society for Surgery of the Hand website and go to Handy. If you're a resident or a surgeon, you can log in there for free and get all kinds of videos about everything for hand surgery. So please uh, do that. You just need to register just like you did for this uh, um, webinar. So I think at this point, I'm going to stop sharing. I'm sorry I've run over a little bit late, uh, but I thought some of the messages were pretty important. So please forgive me for running late. Dr. Presetiono. Not at all, great. You are a great teacher. You travel everywhere and share your experience and knowledge generously, and you still are doing it now. That's what I love from you, and I learned a lot from you. Well, I believe the audience, who, I mean, it's more than 200 stills. They really love your lectures and, and, and kind of like, you know, stimulating to contemplate themselves on how they have been doing. And also, maybe they got like, you know, greater idea on how to apply the principles that you have shared. Well, thank you very much. Not all alone. My pleasure. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, this is now the time for me to invite you to join our key question sessions. And uh, in only for three to five minutes, you would respond to the questions that Professor Lalon has prepared for you. And you will see that you will get direct feedback on which the correct answer. And also, you will get the explanations from it. All right, so let's ask my assistant, Dr. Andreas, to type on the link for the key questions in the chat box. Dr. Andreas, yes. Okay, so colleagues, you may see it in the chat box, the link that you could just uh, click it and then you will see only some questions. Then you will respond to the question to get the key message or some of the key messages so that you could like you know remember better we will also bring you into a fun session after the q a it's going to be game session which is also good for you to take the message again the question will be different from the key questions I mean, the game, the question in the game later would be different from the ones in the key question sessions. That's fantastic, you know. I kind of like, you know, get booster of joining your lecture again. And it's going to be, you know, strengthened my feeling on how to also follow your step to campaign on the use of this the mesen injection, especially with the hand surgery. So excuse us, Don, for several minutes, just to allow the participants to join the key questions. No problem. I'm going to answer questions in the chat room while they're doing that. Oh, great. You help me. <laughs> I mean, I yeah, can do it verbally if you want while they're doing their questions. It's up to you. Yes, we will uh, repeat some of them, although you have responded uh, in written. I think it's good for others to also uh, take lessons from the questions. Sure. Yeah, you may go ahead. And speak? Yes. Okay, so somebody asked, uh, um, does a 3cc syringe with a 27 gauge needle cause more pain compared to a 1cc syringe with a 27 gauge needle? Oh, that's a great question. Um, it depends how fast you inject. It's easier to inject with a smaller syringe, always. 
So a one cc syringe, it's easier to blow it in than a three cc syringe. So a three cc syringe forces you to slow down a little bit. You can really blast it in there with a one cc syringe. And there's level one evidence in humans that if you do a digital block over 60 seconds, that it hurts a lot less than if you do it over 10 seconds. It only takes a minute to do a digital block that hardly hurts at all. But if you just put it in there, and that hurts a lot more. And I know that I've, I've had it both ways. <laughs> so it, there's no doubt about it. So it's, it's a partly about the speed. So you, I use a small syringe for the ease of injection because my basal joints are getting old. I used to inject with 20 cc syringes. Now I inject with 10 cc syringes. Uh, and uh, a 10 cc syringe and a 27 gauge needle for me works pretty well. But I can't push uh, uh, with a 10 cc syringe and a 30 gauge needle. I can't do it. It hurts my thumb too much. So when I'm using a 30 gauge needle, I use a 3 cc syringe or a 5 cc syringe. That's why I do it that way. Well, I may add a bit about that, uh, respond to the questions that you have just uh, answered, Tom. Some of the uh, research that uh, I've done, but I haven't uh, published it yet, that still subjective perceptions about pain influence. Also, the speed with the different pair of syringe and needle, the same speed, but the perception, it's not different significantly. That surprised me a lot because technically we measure the, the pressure through a constant speed in the lab where it gives huge difference in between one cc and 27 or 26 uh, gauge needle compared to five cc. But then percepted by subjects in our research is just the same statistically huh. that's quite yeah, surprising to me that you know still subjective perceptions about pain applies you want to get sure. some comment on that yeah it's it's i think that's really smart of you to look at what they think they feel because <laughs> that's what you know <laughs> yes, yes. That's, what counts. that's very good yeah okay so let's move on to the next question if you would like I got sure. here a question from Eva Rahmi. She thank a uh, great lecture, your great lecture, and she asked, could your technique to minimize pain on local anesthesia, anesthesia injections apply for open wound as for repair preparation? Ah, great question. Thank you for that. Because a lot of the wounds that you saw, like the forehead flap, those people had Mohs surgery before they came to me. So they came with an open wound or if you have an open wound in the emergency department. So if you have an open wound, it's a great opportunity to score a hole in zero. Uh, because what you can do, why go through intact skin and risk damaging the or hitting the uh, uh, leaves in the trees of the skin? Instead, go into the trunks in between, like walking in the, between the trunks of a forest the trees yeah. in the forest. So you put your needle in the fat and you, you see the bevel of your needle going into the fat. As soon as the bevel is covered, start injecting very slowly. And you might miss all the trunks. You might not hit a trunk as you walk into the forest. And so you can score a hole in zero often in an open wound. And so you get into the fat, and as soon as the, you see the locals start to inflate, stop moving your needle. Stop, stop, and just let it inflate. It's a sweet spot. Let it go. And then after you've put in four or five cc's, then you can move your needle around and start to, you know, skate and do whatever you want to do. But that's a great question. Thank you for that. That was a really good question. Very encouraging response as well, you know, to score zero, not hole in yeah, one. Right. Exactly, a hole in zero. Yeah. Uh, we got also a good questions, short but important. When do you use and when you don't use bicarbonate in tumescent? Yeah, I, I use bicarbonate every time that I inject lidocaine with epinephrine, period. 
So I always use it. Now, there is one thing about that, though, okay? Those studies that we did years ago for 1% lidocaine with 1 in 100,000 epinephrine showing that their average pH was 4.2. And if you read on the bottle, the range is 3.3 to 5.5. That It's different if you have 1 in 200,000 epinephrine. The pH is different. And we didn't do those studies for 1 in 200,000 epinephrine. So depending on where you live in the world, you need to do your own pH studies. Like we did pH studies for United States and Canada, uh, lidocaine with epinephrine. Teddy, what, what's your premixed? What does your lidocaine with epinephrine come as? The, or do you have to mix it? You're asking about the pH? No, no, I'm talking about when you buy the stuff, what does the bottle contain? Oh, okay. So the, the epinephrine is one in, one in uh, zero, sorry, one in um, a thousand, and the lidocaine is 2%. Okay, so you're mixing them fresh. Okay. Yes. But, all right, you're not getting it pre-mixed like I get. So here's the thing. I have never done the studies to find out what the pH of 2% lidocaine with pure one in a thousand epinephrine, if you mix that, What's the pH of that? I don't know. So the answer to your question is, and it's a great question because we need research all over the world on this. Is somebody in Teddy's lab or somebody somewhere should measure the pH of when you mix one in a thousand epinephrine and 2% lidocaine, measure the pH of that and then measure how much bicarbonate you have to make to make that pH 7.4. That study has not been done that I'm aware of. Please do it. <laughs> do it for yeah. that. Do it for one in 200,000 epinephrine, like they can buy it in Europe. Like, I, I don't know if those studies have been done. If they have, I haven't seen them. Yeah, that's, that's, that's good. I think I'm concerned on to uh, uh, asking my residents also to join on that project. The, yeah, it's easy to do. Yeah, the next question related to that is that when mixing lidocaine in bicarbonate, there will be crystallizations, according to this uh, gentleman, Dr. Purnawan. Is it safe? And if not, how to avoid it? Yeah, you know what? That's a great question, and I don't understand it, okay? I don't understand it. So please uh, do research and educate me. But I have seen it. So I don't get crystallization in Canada. Okay. If I mix bicarb and 1% lidocaine with 1 in 100,000 epinephrine, I don't get it. But when I was in Nepal, <laughs> back in the days before COVID, when we used to be able to travel, um, I injected bicarb into their lidocaine with epinephrine and it yep. crystallized. The crystals all went away uh, and I don't know if the crystals are bad. I don't know if, if it causes a problem. I know that if I put uh, bicarb into bupivacaine with epinephrine in Canada, it crystallizes, but I don't use much bupivacaine. So I, I don't like bupivacaine. I don't like long acting local anesthetics. Uh, so I don't, but that's a great question and I'm sorry, I don't know the answer. We need more research to learn about crystallization, what causes it, is it dangerous, and I don't know. Yes, I cannot help you as well as I've never used that bicarbonate. <laughs> okay, so, there you go. You, maybe yeah, you don't but, need it. Maybe you don't need bicarbonate with 2% lidocaine with uh, pure epinephrine. Maybe the pH is like, uh, 7.2. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. So that's why I have no problem with that so far. <laughs> I've been 11 years following your steps. <laughs> so we get the question here from a very famous uh, orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Suroto. That's great experiences. Actually, I have used your formula with 1% lidocaine and 1 in 100,000 in acute scenario for soft tissue and bony tissue surgery. But unfortunately, in reconstructions of mal union of phalangeal fracture, the patient still feel painful. Any comment on using tumescent in chronic case? 
Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Sirodo. That's a great question. And you know, I think I think that um, when I have had pain, and I have uh, had pain, I've had all kinds of pain. <laughs> uh, but uh, most of the time, it's because I don't have everything totally soaked in local. And when you have scar from an old injury, the local anesthesia does not penetrate as well. Uh, and it's hard for it to traverse scar planes. So you have to go proximal to all scar planes and totally to mess everything. And then move as best you can into the scar planes or around them and to mess again to make sure everything is blown up. And then you may need to wait a little longer. Like I always wait at least a half an hour before I cut. And I know a lot of people can't do that. And I have found that if I do those things, if I make sure everything is well to mess proximal to the scar, all around the scar and distal to the scar, and I can see it like blown up, then it doesn't hurt. But you know, I don't have the answer for everything. That's a great question though, Dr. Siroto. Thank you. Yeah, right. But I may share a bit of my experience with burn, with hand burn with all about scar, and even it's about scar contracture, you need to be patient. Yeah. And I, in my practice, a bit more in terms of volume than what Dr. Lalong has advised. For example, if he advised two milliliter of doing simple block, then I, with one per millimeter solution, may need four milliliter just to uh, provide simple block. An example where you need to be patient to allow your fluid, the tumescent, to infiltrate the scar tissue. And hopefully it works. Hopefully. Yeah. Okay. That's, uh, I, I agree that, I, that one of the keys here is big volume. Usually when, I, when people send me pictures and videos, there's not enough volume. Like, blow it up. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. A question from Dr. Stewart. I found, that, uh, found it difficult to get good anesthesia when trying to do an extensor tenoarthrolysis around the MCP joint. Do you have any special tips for getting numbness in the MCP joint? Yeah, definitely. Uh, if, if you look in the Wide Awake Hand Surgery book, there's very nice drawings. And, and somebody else also said, how do we know how much volume we're going to need? There's an atlas in the Wide Awake Hand Surgery book that tells you how much volume you need to cover different areas. And there's drawings and estimations of the volume for all the different areas. But if you got a stuck MP joint, that's what you're talking about. And so you're going to divide the collateral ligaments and you're going to do an extensor tendon tenolysis. That's what you're talking about, Dr. Stewart. So for those, uh, I think you can see my hand here. So uh, what I would do is I would start by putting at least 10 milliliters uh, proximal to that MP joint in the palm, and maybe even 15 or 20 milliliters. It's always better too much than not enough. And I don't even move my needle. I just put a 27 gauge needle there, put it in there and put two 10 cc syringes and blow the crap out of it. So now all of the volar digital nerves are knocked out. Then I go on to the dorsum of the hand and you're probably gonna need an incision that goes from there to there to do your tenolysis, right? So I'm gonna go proximal to where the most proximal part of my incision is. And I'm gonna put a 27 gauge needle in there and I'm gonna put in at least 10 cc's without moving for starters. And then I'll probably blow up and come down in between the metacarpal heads of both sides of that MP joint and make sure that in between the metacarpal heads, everything's blown up. And on the top, I will probably end up with about 20 milliliters, maybe 25 or 30. It's got to look, and I want both metacarpals on top to be like that. You know, like it, too much is better than not enough. And if you do that and you wait half an hour, you do it, inject them before they come in the operating room. If you're doing it in the main operating room, they're going to be good. 
Great. <clears throat> Dr. Alon, also you have written in your book about guide on how much volume. I think it's going to be good for, for, for the audience to hear from you a questions from Dr. Marcetio here. How do, you ask, how do we estimate the minimum volume of premix solutions that we would need, for example, based on the area of surgery or the estimated time duration? Yeah, I, I think it's more about area than it is about time of surgery. Uh, but at wide awake surgery, you gotta, be, you gotta be done by four hours, I think. Uh, I mean, you can go longer. That case with the four FDS tendons that I did in Honduras, we had never dug out those A2 pulleys before. Uh, and so this was a first for us. And I did it with another surgeon from Michigan in Honduras. But that case took four and a half hours and that patient was starting to get sore at the end. So we had to top up the local, which I hate to do. Uh, but in general, wide awake surgery, you know, you really ought to be done by three hours. Uh, and if you're going to run more than three hours, then you need to run longer, or you have to get into my arch enemy bupivacaine. <laughs> um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, estimating the size of the volume, again, if you go look in the book, it shows you, if you draw out the area, this is how much volume you're going to need for every operation there is. Uh, and uh, the atlas shows you if you put 20 milliliters right there and don't move the needle, where does the local go? And it shows you where it goes. And I had residents inject me and we drew where it went. I, I was the model for that. So you're talking about a guy in his 60s, sorry. Um, but anyway, uh, th that's where the atlas came from. And the, the atlas will give you an idea of how much you need but you've got to know how much in your head before you go in. And so you're always better to uh, plan way more than you need for volume of local anesthesia. And so if you go to low concentration, quarter percent with one in 400,000 epinephrine, which is totally effective for three hours, you, you got 200 milliliters, so you just blow everything up and just make sure that you look wherever you're going to dissect, okay? Draw that with a pen, wherever you're going to dissect. And then make sure that when you're finished injecting, that there's good local at least two centimeters outside where you've drawn, and then you're going to be okay. Now, the, the one thing about that is also if you're doing long bones, like distal radius or tibia or clavicle, you have to inject the periosteum all around, not in the metacarpal or the phalanx, because you can flood the hand, but in long bones, it's harder to flood. And so you need to uh, keep your needle on the bone and do periosteal injections all the way around, again, proximal to distal when you're doing long bone fractures. I'm not an orthopedic surgeon. I don't do long bone fractures, but that's what my orthopedic colleagues have taught me. Yes, all right. So an opinion here we got from Dr. Kitan of the Netherlands that you know, it's better to let the anesthesiologist to do the, the injections for you and then you do more cases rather than you do it yourself to inject the anesthesia, the tumescent. What do you comment on that, Don? Well, I think that's a great idea. I think if you, like, like the anesthesiologist I showed you in England, you know, if your anesthesiologist is willing to inject local uh, tumescent local anesthesia, wonderful. I wish they would. <laughs> uh, part of the problem is in Canada, they can't. Because if they don't give sedation with an intravenous, they don't get paid. It's sad and it's a little bit sick, but that's the way it is. Um, but in some countries, like in Australia and in England, and uh, I know in some parts of France, the anesthesiologists can get paid for tumescent local anesthesia, and maybe they can in the Netherlands. May could you tell us? Can do they get paid in the Netherlands? I love this. Anyway, uh, the ideal situation for me would be 
I got an anesthetist in one room injecting all of my patients. I am in another room doing nothing but surgery. <laughs> I don't need to inject local anesthesia to uh, make me happy. If I have an anesthesiologist who's good at it, and he's not hurting people, uh, we could make a great team. Uh, and so they could do that. And then, and then the patients just come to me in another room. I do the surgery. They leave early. <laughs> you know, I can you know, have a nice day. That could work. It would be more expensive because you're going to pay another doctor. But still, it could be very efficient. I think it's a great idea. Can you do that in the Netherlands? Do you do that? Yes, he responded that, you know, they got paid in the Netherlands. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. Well, okay. So I think the discussion has been quite, you know, florist. And I'm happy to uh, see the response from the audience. I think now I'll bring the audience to go for a fun session. It's going to be like a game. So ladies and gentlemen, you may see the link in the chat box, www, oh, no, 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 the kahoot.it. You may just uh, click that active link and then let's join a short game. It's going to be only less than five minutes. So here you see the, the pin to join the game and then use your, your ID name, so it's your name or your ID, whatever you would like to write. Then we could start the game after I see quite a number of you joining. Okay, I think it's enough participants already. Now let's start. The first one. Coming up. To lessen the pain from the needle puncture, you may perform or use the following except. So quite good number. Let's move to the next. Oh, let's see who's on top so far. He or she who, who was the fastest and correct. TMC. Congratulations, TMC. Let's move to the next. Little diameter is used in the hand. Okay, so the smallest will be better or the best. Yes, now whether the MC is keeping his position. 
Oh, new person, it's the age. Let's see to the third questions. Among the following tissue level, an amount of loop injected injection produces less pain. Supposedly, the blue one is not wrong, but then, you know, the best is still the green, uh, sorry, the, the, the brown one, the yellow one. Okay. Enough that you can see it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, let's see who's on top now. Tikong. Tikong. Wow, congratulations, Tikong. Now the next. The following sequences is the best to create last spin. Congratulations! Great. They were listening. Yeah, <laughs> you are successful, uh, Doctor Lalon. Okay, let's see who's on top. T Kong is still winning. Congratul congratulations! Keeping position. Now the last one. Besides needle puncture, fluid infiltration causes pain. How do you deal with fluid infiltration to reduce pain at best? was expecting a hundred percent correct but it's well, still good yeah the blue one is not totally wrong you know, what's the difference yeah. between slow and very slow but you know that's great fantastic right yes okay now who's the winner yeah you may come up to the podium at number three and the runner up is And the top, Tikong. <laughs> That's fun. Congratulations, Dr. Tikong. Well, ladies and gentlemen, here I would like to uh, type a link in the chat box, but this link is for only a surgeon, I mean, orthopedic surgeon, plastic surgeon, or hand surgeon and also resident in hand surgery, plastic surgery, or orthopedic surgery to join questionnaire, uh, I mean survey. So it would be fantastic if you could uh, join the survey and it helps a lot on how we and Dr. Lalon and the team in the ASSH and also people in the Michigan to develop a greater and better idea of educational webinars and also sessions. And we may reach you because we need about 30 people to be able willingly to join the interview. So we will reach you, especially the hand surgeon, plastic and orthopedic surgeon or the residents. Sorry for the GP and also the medical student if you are there with us, but we really thank you for joining this great sessions and especially let's give big applause to Professor Lalon. Wonderful. 
Thank you. John, it's been very thank nice you. evening for us. Yeah, thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here. I really appreciated everybody's coming and staying so long and listening to me all this time and not falling asleep. Everybody's still wide awake. Thank you. Great. Wide awake. Right. <laughs> nice phrase. Thank you very much and see you next time. Dr. Alon, goodbye. Bye-bye. Enjoy your day. You too.